Look who it is, the man himself, the legend of JFK, Kennedy Steve in the house. Back to my old stomping ground. Yeah, how does it feel? It's like deja vu all over again. Yeah, yeah, does, you, does it make your heart, you know, go out of control, is it? It's all good, leaving it up to the professionals up there. They're yeah. much more suited to do this than I am. It's a young man's game, and I'm not a young man anymore. <laughs> How many years ago did you retire? Six. Six years ago. So do you come here pretty often and just hang out and still watch the planes? Uh, no. No? No, I do not. You know what, I'm lucky I actually live under the LaGuardia finals. So if I want to watch airplanes, I can just sit in my backyard, smoke a cigar, enjoy a tequila, and look up in the There air. you go. There you go. There you go. But you're, uh, I mean, you've been to the TWA a few times and I, coming out here to just relax? Yeah, I have been to the TWA hotel. It's very nostalgic. I mean... I guess I show my age. I remember flying out of this terminal. Yeah. Back, oh. Back in the day. Oh. Back in the day. And what's that? What's that one memory that comes to your, your mind in a in a an instant? I I think when I was first started in the FAA, I was jump seating on a TWA TriStar, wow. which shows you how long ago that was. Wow. Um, and I was actually surprised at the amazing size of the cockpit. Yeah. But it was a great airplane to fly. In. So. I guess, you know, I think everyone wants to know, do you have a background in aviation? Is your love for aviation always been there, or is this something that just happened? So, I, I had a love for aviation growing up. I think, you know, the first airplane I ever went on, I was six years old. And uh, my father took me to London on a BOAC VC-10. Again, wow. showing my age. Yeah, yeah. Um, and ever since then, I was, I was kind of hooked. I think if you... If you're in this industry, you got the bug. You either yeah. love it or you don't. Yeah. Um, and I had the hook. Yeah. So, so I ended up here. Anybody watching here today, I, I think a lot of people know who you are. Maybe there's some that are like, I have no idea who Kevin's talking to. I'm talking to a legend over here. You want to fill us in who you are? What What have you been doing all these years here at JFK? So I uh, worked at Kennedy for about 24 years. Um, and I guess my notoriety or fame came about because through Live ATC, and I had a rather unique way of working ground. Okay. Um, because I figured pilots and controllers, when it's really busy, get really stressed. And I tried to inject as much humor as I could into a very stressful situation. Uh, so so we blame it. Live ATC, or, or not really blame it, but Live ATC really is what brought you to the foreground, huh? Yes, absolutely. Interesting. Because once, uh, once the frequency got broadcast over the internet, people started to tune in and listen. Interesting. And they heard something different. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> what it was, was different. And what would you, what's the difference? How would you describe the difference? Well, I, you know, I think most people when they listen to ATC frequencies hear pretty standardized robotic transmissions because in reality that's kind of the way you're taught to do this. Right. Um, when I worked ground, and it was only on ground, I never did it while airplanes were up in the air because obviously pilots have different levels of intensity that they're going through and taxiing right. is not one of the most intense parts of their job. Right. Um, you know, you have to kind of try and lighten up the situation when you tell somebody they're number 84 for departure. Right. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to sit on the ground for a long time. They don't want to sit in a long conga line and taxiing. So I it makes tried sense. to make it fun. Makes sense. Um, you have a lot of different stories out there. A lot oh, yeah. of, if, if you just go on YouTube and you just search your name, some people have put a collage of you know, some of your most rememberable moments here at JFK. Um, is there one that stands out to you? You know, they were I, the only, you know, my most distinct memories are when things got very hairy Yeah. Um, and weren't funny. And I think the, in my career, there were two. The, I, I, scary is a poor choice of words, but I, I wasn't controlling the airplanes and was working ground at the time, but we had uh, a British Airways 747 execute a missed approach on 22 left with the Tower Air 747 departing 13 right. And it's the only time in my life I've seen a 747-200 turned at a 45 degree angle. Wow. At about 300 feet trying to avoid another airplane. Yeah, so yeah. that was a pretty distinct memory. Right, right. Uh, a lot of the moments that we see on YouTube are a lot of your funny moments. Yes. Uh, any any funny moments that kind of stands out to you? I, you know, I, I actually my, my, 
my best memory and funniest moment was not something that I said. Um, one of my coworkers was working Air India one day, and he was landing 31 right. There was an airplane very close behind him, and uh, the controller was in the nicest way possible trying to expedite him off the runway. Yeah. And the pilot was kind of taking his time and taking his time, and he was reminded and pushed and pushed, and he finally came back and said, Tower, this is not a motor car, this is a jumbo jet. Ooh. We are turning yeah. as fast as we can. Yeah. I just thought it was hilarious. Because <laughs> at the time, it kind of was funny. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you have a thing with the, the tugs. You know, even before you got here, there was a tug over here, and I saw in the chat, they were like, Delta tug number five? Is that, or number two? Was it two or number five? You know what, they were all, the, the numbers were irrelevant. You know? yeah. So, in priority of things that you work when you're a ground controller and you're busy, a tug is number last. Okay. I mean, there's yeah. basically nothing less important because right. you're repositioning an empty airplane. Right. Um, right. And they tended to show up at the worst possible times with radios that were not very good because they're basically handheld transceivers um, in cars. So they were difficult to yeah. read. Yeah. Just kind of, they were easy to make fun of. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any uh, uh, any one that stands out in your mind? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think the uh, I remember when I was training, and you know, this is obviously a long time ago. Um, Singapore Airlines used to come in here with a 747 400. Uh -huh. They'd come in the morning, they'd park it down at the end of a taxiway all day, and then they'd bring it back to what was then Terminal 3. Okay. Uh, the old Pan Am World Port. And this airplane would reposition at like 6.30 to 6.45 every night at the busiest time we had yeah. on ground. Yeah. And everybody would just drag it, dread talking to him. And, you know, he was, the Singapore used to call their 747s Megatops. Y yes, yeah. Oh, so yeah. So the tug was Singapore Mike. And boy, did people hate talking to Singapore Mike at 630 every day. Singapore night. Mike. Singapore Mike. Interesting. Interesting. Well, you know, there's, there's one that I've heard you talk about on other interviews, and it was definitely documented in that video I just saw on YouTube about the Lufthansa pilot out taxiing out to the runway for departure and, and talks to you and asks you, hey, uh, we have a, a panel open. Yeah. Can we open it? Can we get out of the plane and go check it out? <laughs> yeah, he was uh, he was on his way to 31 left one afternoon, and and this is a while ago, because I think it was, I think the airplane was an A340-300, though I, I'm not 100% sure. And he wanted to climb out through the bottom of the cockpit, through the gear well, yeah. and close an access panel as opposed to taxiing back to the ramp. And he really wasn't in the way, and I wasn't really sure at the time whether we had a prohibition of doing such things, yeah. so I said, go for it, and he did. Okay. But he, but he, he did actually, he didn't get out, though. Oh, no. He, oh, he did he, get out. Yeah, I think he got out of the oh, airplane and gosh. closed the access panel, which he could obviously reach, and got back in, and off they went. And that was the first for you? First for me. And and never happened ever again, Never right? happened again, because we were told that was uh, yeah, oh, not allowed. Okay. You can't have people kind of wandering about yeah. in the taxiways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Port yeah. Authority frowns on that for obvious reasons. Interesting. You know, a lot of people were saying, it's too bad, Kevin, that you weren't here. Too bad the Concorde's not here. Obviously, it's been gone for a long time. You were here. You were here working when it was here a lot. Oh, yeah. Kind of describe what that was like as a controller. So for controllers at Kennedy, when you first got here, you thought the Concorde was the coolest thing in the world. And then you worked it and hated it. Yeah. Um, it couldn't slow down. It had very high landing speed. It had very specific runway requirements because of noise. Um, it just couldn't do things that most other airplanes could do. So yeah. it, was, it was a pain. A pain. He was a pain. <laughs> He was a pain. <laughs> Did you guys get Air France and British Airways? Yes. You got both yeah, of them yeah, in there. Yeah. Did they come at the same time, or were they separated throughout the course of the day? Um, so there were two British Airways Concords daily and one Air France. Wow. Um, and Air France, the Air France arrival and the one of the BA departures used to, you know, occasionally they'd coincide, and Air France could only land on four right, and BA could only depart two to right. Right. Because of wind, and I 
you know, have memories of seeing British Airways over the approach lights this way, or Air France over the approach lights this way with BA going that way. Wow. Which is pretty cool. It had to have been massively loud. Yeah, well, the departure was loud. The arrival actually wasn't yeah. too bad. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was really the only airplane you could hear even up in the control tower. It was really loud. Now, you were actually in the control tower the day, the last day that the Concorde was here yes, at JFK. I was. What was that day like? You know, nostalgic. You know, yeah. the, uh, I, I think there's a, and I, I think it's being refurbished now, the Concorde that's at the Intrepid Museum. There's oh, a video yeah. okay. that they shot that day. But it was, uh, you know, it was bittersweet seeing yeah. it leave. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, great moments of aviation that you were witness to here at JFK? Uh, you know, I, I've seen a lot of crazy stuff here. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was uh, unfortunately the the ground controller when TW800 took off. Um, a really bad memory. A yeah. Bad memory when Swiss Air 111 left here. Right. Um, obviously, a lot of memories from 911. Right. Um, right. You kind of, you know, I, I, I've said you don't you don't really remember good days. You just remember when things went wrong. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I think that's true with anything in life, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, what you been doing since you retired from here? <laughs> so, you know, I retired from here six years ago. I worked for uh, four years in the private sector at, at one of the terminals out here. And I stopped doing that actually just about a year ago. And for the last year, I have been happily retired. Nice. Working on my golf game. Nice. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm very happy not to work anymore. Retirement's a great thing. And I, I saw in another um, interview, they asked you if you ever got your private license, and you said no, because I, I get terrible motion sickness. Wow. So I would, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going around flying in a little airplane. Just a little plane. You're, you're fine with commercial and, and all that. Uh, so just. you know, my general rule of thumb is, I'm happy flying in an airplane when there's a professional flying it. Yeah. 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 If it's somebody who doesn't do it for a living, I have no interest in getting on your yeah. airplane. That's, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, but yeah. That's, that's just Steve's rule. Yes, Steve, yes. All right, well, everyone watching at home, this is a live interview. If you guys have any questions for Kennedy, Steve, he's standing here right next to me, let us know. We'll let Steve catch his breath here for a second. I will zoom the camera into some heavy action over here. So another great moment that I saw in those videos, uh, trying to get pilots' attention sometimes didn't work off, didn't work too well sometimes. Oh. Not not you know talking back to you and you, you Earth Earth do so and so was that a constant thing? Yeah, you used to wonder whether people were uh, if radio if they were on other frequencies or they just were ignoring you. Uh, and it just became frustrating because you're trying to control something that you have no control over. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Was was one of them uh, with a Turkish airline? Oh, I, I, I mean, I, I I think I've used Earth to many <laughs> different airlines. It's, you know, people got lost in megahertz, were on wrong frequencies. Right. And after you call them three or four times, you you got to come up with something to make sure that you don't. Oh. Don't lose your mind. And what was the reaction when you said, Earth to so-and-so? Uh, uh, well, unfortunately, they never heard you. Oh, you know? oh that's true, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and one of my, you know, that, that along with, I can't see you nodding your head, you actually have to answer, um, <laughs> was also popular. Right. <laughs> Did, uh, you know, I've, we've talked to other ATC uh professionals and some are you know they sometimes like to joke around a little bit and we've been told that sometimes the you know managers you know don't appreciate it bring it down a, a few notches anytime that ever happened to any anybody here at JFK any you or anybody else who's you know I think the general rule of thumb is having situational awareness of Knowing when you can say something humorous right. and knowing when you can't, 
um, and making sure it's humorous and not rude or unpleasant because right. the job can get frustrating. Right, right. Uh, and you got to be good at what you're doing to get away with not doing it the standard way. Yeah. Do you miss it? No. No? I, I mean, the parts I miss, but in general, it's a young man's profession. Yeah. I, I, you know, throughout my career, I never agreed with the age 56 retirement rule. I had no idea. I thought it was a rather arbitrary age that they came up with. Yeah. And I had no agreement with it till I was about 53. And then I thought, yeah, maybe this is a good rule. And then 55, I kind of went, oh, yeah, this is a great rule. Because the job just got harder. Yeah. I mean, it used to be, I, I won't say routine, but, you know, I could do it. And you're taking a break and you're just kind of relaxing. The last year I worked, my brain worked a lot harder than it did for the previous 26 years. I mean, I was mentally exhausted when I unplugged for a Can break. I ask you, though, why, why did that job get harder? Can you explain maybe why? I think your mental acuity just suffers. Okay. I mean, I, I just, you know, I think NASA came up with the age 56 rule, and I, I, there's just a level of validity to it. Yeah. I think you just don't, you can't process information and look, I'm not a, I'm not a psychiatrist. I have no neuroscience degree. I just don't think you can. For me personally, I couldn't process information as quickly okay. as I could when I was younger. Okay. Um, I think you know one of the great traits to be good at this job is to have a wonderful 60-second memory. I think my memory wasn't as good as it was before, and I have to okay. think harder to retain information. Okay. And that's what made it more difficult. Interesting. Yeah, I was. Uh, well, when you said that, I uh, first thing in my uh, popped in my head was like, well, didn't technology improve? But that's really not what you're talking about. You're just talking about. Yeah, I mean, throughout physically. my career, the technology did improve, which yeah. made it, you know, <laughs> but technology isn't making your decisions. Yeah. Technology is providing you information, and you still have to make the right decision. Right. Um, and there's just greater thought process required in making those. It, it, I felt like there was greater thought process required in making those decisions as I got older. I think uh, some people are asking, uh, Kennedy, Steve, what's the best aircraft out there in your mind? So, you know, for me, I'm a big fan of the 787 and the A350, and it's for silly reasons. You know, I don't know if it's a silly reason, but the air in the airplane is better. Yeah. I mean, since it's composite fuselage, it's not as dry. You're flying at a lower ambient altitude than you do in other yeah, things. Yeah, I agree. Um, I find it to be more comfortable yeah. if for, for long-distance passenger travel. Um, so, uh, Another question from Tony. Uh, can you explain the differences in the positions for ATC? So now here at the tower here at JFK, you have ground. Now we just missed a queen. See, I'm not doing my job, Kennedy Steve. You're more interested. So, you know, in a tower cab, um, there'll be a clearance delivery controller where their responsibility is basically to sell, to tell the pilot, you know, you're going from JFK to LA and this is the way you're going, this is the altitude you're going, this is the route you're taking. Um, the clearance delivery controller would, would give the flight progress strip either physically or electronically, depending on the technology in the cab. Right. So the ground controller, ground controller's responsibility is take the airplane either from the ramp to the runway or all the arrivals from the runway back to the ramp. Okay. Local controller is responsible for takeoffs and landings. Um, in most airports nowadays, when it's busy, there are multiple local controllers, so they're only working one runway at a time. Uh, there can be more than one ground controller based on the geometry and the size of the airport. And then there'll be uh, what in air, what we call the TCA controller, and they work the airspace five mile ring around the airport up to 2,000 feet, over flights, helicopters, things like that, to keep them away from the itinerant IFR traffic. Um, and, and those positions, did you have a preference? Did you have, did you like one over the other? I think ground was the most fun. It was the most fun, yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, you can, you can't stop the airplanes from coming. Yeah. And there's a certain art to doing it well. Right. Um, right. You know, anybody can make a line of airplanes. It's making a line of airplanes that's efficient. Right. Um, and efficiency is, you know, size of the aircraft, who it follows, direction of flight, and all things like that. Um, it just, 
you know, added a little something to, to what you were doing. Kind of off airport thinking here, Steve. Yankees, Mets, Jets, Giants, Knicks, Nets, Islanders, or Rangers? See, now here are the tough questions, right? So, <laughs> really fun. I mean, not funny, but odd. You're going to get odd answers. So, <laughs> I was not born. I was born in South Africa. So I'm not oh, wow. native to the okay. U.S. Okay. And because of that, my parents obviously were not U.S. citizens. So I grew up here with kind of no direction as to which teams to follow. Okay. Um, in football, I'm a 49er fan. Wow. And I've been a 49er fan since the John Brody days. Wow. And the reason is the first football game I watched, and I was probably five or six years old, uh -huh. were the Rams and the 49ers. And I picked the 49ers, and I've been a fan ever since. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm, you know, hockey, I like the Rangers and the Islanders. I have no great affinity to either one. I, I go to both games. I think they're both fun to watch. Uh, and in baseball, so uh, my first baseball game I went to was in Fenway Park because my brother went to college in Boston, took me to a game. Uh, probably a bad thing to say as a New Yorker, but yeah, I'm right Sox. <laughs> there you go. Don't hey. hold it against me. There you go. So I'm asking back to uh, back to life as an ATC controller. Uh, what happens if ATC gets mad at the pilots? Is anything you know? Is anything documented? Does any anybody go back and listen to the tapes and kind of you know? Does the, does the company get involved and say, "Listen, why, why were you not talk, Why were you not responding to ATC? What was going on there? Is there any anything that happens in that sense?" So, you know, I, I think there's a there's a pretty distinct line between frustrated, yeah, as a controller, and a pilot mistake, yeah, and you know, controllers get frustrated for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, the stress of the job is, is one of the biggest ones. Um, but a pilot error or a pilot deviation right. is a very, very, very big thing. Right. And controllers do not walk down that path yeah. lightly. Yeah. Because there's a true realization that there are big requirements of the airline, of the Flight Standards District Office, and it can have a pretty chilling effect yeah. um, on the pilot. So we hear it sometimes at LAX, uh, uh, deviation, call, Possible blah, pilot blah, deviation, blah, 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 yeah. call the number. What happens So the pilot calls that number and then someone in another office somewhere explains it to them and says this is what happened? And So I will tell you what happens here because I don't know what they did in LAX. Okay. Um, at Kennedy, when we had you call the tower, Yeah. The, the words on the frequency possible pilot deviation right. were almost never said. Okay. Um, because, you know, from the controller's perspective, you know, one of the, the errors that we get a lot or controllers have a lot are called readback errors. Okay. Where you have, um, what's the term, situational bias or ex right. expectation bias okay. that you tell somebody something and you, they may have read back something completely opposite, but you expected them to say, hold short, and they say, you know, we had an incident with right. an airline that was told to hold short, and they right. read back no hold short. Okay. okay. Um, so before you tell somebody there's a pilot deviation, you want to be 100% sure from the controller's perspective that everybody heard everything, everybody read back everything correctly. Right. So we would, if there was an issue like that, we would tell the flight crew to call the tower. Okay. The supervisor would go down and listen to the tapes and find out what happened. The supervisor would have the conversation with the flight crew to find out from their end what happened. Um, and really it was the supervisor's determination as to whether a pilot deviation was filed. Okay. And like the controller, they realized the impact of doing that and tried at all costs to really to avoid doing that. Yeah. Uh, a question, I think we kind of, you already talked about this, any real tense ATC conversation? There was, in that video that I'm I keep on talking about on YouTube, uh, it's done with the animation. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen it? It's I actually really well done. The very open of that is an Aeroflot A330 that's still on the runway. It's right there. Uh, right he, over he here. He would have been okay. right there. So Aeroflot is, uh, 
So we were landing both 22s at the time, oh. and Airflot is told to cross 22 right at Foxtrot, make a left turn on Alpha. He comes across to you right, and he stops. And his tail is absolutely hanging out on the road. Wow. And there's an airplane on short final. I mean, that, you know, who's going to have to go around? Yeah. Um, and I just wanted him to move because I didn't want a guy going around. And, and that's the only reason I'm yelling at him. I'm like, just taxi the airplane. I don't yeah. care where you taxi the airplane. Just don't stop. Yeah. Um, and it's to prevent a go around. And I know from... <clears throat> Excuse me. From the pilot perspective, look, a go around is not a big deal. They're used to it. Um, passengers hate them. They get scared to death. Yeah. From the pilot perspective, it's all a part of doing business. But we were busy at the time. Yeah. And injecting another, like that guy right there. Which one? Air Air Act Cargo. I can guarantee you, he wasn't told turn left and stop. Oh. And there he is, stopped. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody says turn left and stop with your tail on the rumble. Kennedy, Steve, I'm, I'm getting the sense that you're you're, you're kind of getting back into the, the seat over here. Well, and, and, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like those are the things that frustrate you. It's a pretty simple instruction. Turn left, box drive. Taxi right, right rumble. Right. And they stop. And sometimes they stop because they want to go the other way. I'm like, I, I mean, I have a, a very good memory of KLM coming out of this ramp one day. Who was going to toot you right? Yeah. And the shortest way is obviously <laughs> to the left. And I told him to go right because there was a long line of airplanes. Can he, uh, Steve, I, I'm starting to understand why you don't come out here and, and, oh, and yeah. just watch it's the planes. Because I could see it, 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 it get, you, uh, you get you a little upset. Yeah, just a well, little bit. you know. So I tell him to go right. And he said, All right, you want us to go left on Bravo? I said, No, right. I need you to go right on Alpha. And he said, You sure you don't want me to go left on Bravo? I said, Yes, I need you to go right on Alpha. And he came back the third time. Can we go left on Bravo? I said, sir, here are your choices. You go right on Alpha now, or you wait yeah. 43 minutes for the next controller, and maybe they'll take you left on Bravo. But those are your choices. Is, do you think that there's a issue with international carriers and the, the language issues, maybe not understanding certain things? Do you think that's what... In, in, uh, so, I, look, I think, you know, one of the things that, that I think airline pilots don't expect is they don't expect... 25, 30 airplane long lines. Yeah. That's, you know, intuitively it does not make sense to take me a mile out of my way taxiing to go to a runway. Like, yeah. I understand it didn't make sense to him. Um, but when you explain that, you know, there are 25 other airplanes in line and I need you to go that way and they're thinking, well, I should just go this way and just wait. But right. it doesn't work like that. Right. It's, right. it's like closing a lane on a highway. Like, I just want to park here and wait till it's my turn. You, you can't do but that. But where does that come from? Where does that frame of mind come from? I, I would assume every airport in the world pretty much acts the same way, right? Well, I, you know, I think newer airports have what I call better airport geometry. Okay. Um, they're laid out in such a way, you know, if you look at Atlanta or Chicago, they're laid out in such a way that they're three feeder taxiways to one runway. So, a controller can pick and choose who they want to go next. Right. And you can sit somewhere and wait if there's an in-trail restriction. But here, there's one or maybe two entrances to the runway. You right. need to keep taxiing to keep your spot in line. It's just the geometry of the airport. So, JFK is, is uh, it's not laid out the way you think, maybe. Well, well it's I, older. It's older. It's you know? older. It's, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's not new. I mean, yeah. the Port Authority's done a bunch of improvements to make the geometry better. Right. Um, but, you know, you, you, know can, you, could, you, you could move a lot more traffic at this airport if you had more rumbles. You know, our <laughs> friend at Later Tater, uh, ATC controller there at LAX, when we sat down and talked to him for the podcast, he said, you know, LAX was designed for a 727 back in the day. Right. Same thing. Think here, right? You got A380s. You got the, you know, all this jazz you got to deal with. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. You all right? I'm good. <laughs> I'm all good. Well, what's Ita doing over there? Uh, heading to the, the so, gates. So he's either waiting there for one of two reasons. Um, one is his gate isn't available, or the other reason is, you know, they're landing and departing four left. Uh -huh. So gaps are few and far between, um, and they probably want to roll 
uh, a heavy jet to get a bigger in trail gap to get him across the runway. You know, I, just I would assume that's a challenge with JFK too because the wind's constantly changing here. You know, at LAX, basically east, you got the, the west flow pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time. Here, I mean, we've seen it change already four times since I've been up this morning. Yeah, so this airport will, will runway change at least four times a day. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's a bank issue. They'll have two arrival runways early in the morning, two departure runways after that for the morning departure push. This is an arrival heavy period of time, so they'll always have two arrival runways. Okay. And later in this afternoon, if the winds stay like this, they'll land four right, depart four left, and 31 left to have two departure runways just to keep the place out of the Interesting. Legs. Okay. And what time does that usually happen to run? Uh, between four and five o'clock. Four and five. All right. So I guess we'll have to stay a little bit later. Any other moments that just come to your mind that... You know, I, I, I will say I like coming to this airport now as a passenger a whole lot more than I did for work. Yeah? It's, uh, it, it's a different <laughs> level of commute, that's for sure. Yeah? And I, but, I don't, but I don't miss the commute. It's, uh, Do you travel a lot? Uh, you know, yeah, fair amount. Yeah. Um, with, uh, with all my kids out of the house now uh, and my wife about to retire, the only thing that precludes us from traveling is finding somebody to take care of my crazy dog. Yeah, uh, yeah it's always a challenge. Always for a sure. challenge, but yeah, we, we try and... Can I ask you when you're on the plane and you're taxiing out to the runway, do you get on your phone and, and listen to live ATC and kind of listen to the, the controllers and kind of see what's going on? Or no. You're done. No, you're done. I'm done. I'm done. The book is closed. The you book know, is closed. You know what I do? I, I make sure to... Uh, I, I try and make sure to fly when it's not busy. Oh, okay. And avoid, you know, yeah. situations that can be that can be impacted by delays. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, uh, I... Uh, I live north of here, so I tend to do a lot of flying out of White Plains now because okay. it's 10 minutes from my house. It's never really busy. Yeah. They're not ATC delays usually. So, You think you'd ever write a book about your, your life as a JFK controller? Yeah, I might. Yeah? I might. You know, I, I've, I've kind of been, been enjoying my first year of doing nothing, and maybe yeah. I'll get bored with it. So. Yeah. If I end up spending my winters in New York and I can't play golf, yeah. Well, there you go. To do I think it'd be a good ball. idea. Good idea. Yeah. All right. Well, Kennedy, Steve, we won't uh, keep up your time anymore here. I'm sure you got a golfing game to get to. There you go. Or just hang out at the TWA Hotel. Uh, thank you so much my for pleasure. dropping by and, and talking with us. And I got to tell you, all these videos on YouTube, the audio, the ATC clips, I'm telling you, some good stuff out there. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I, I I remember my my oldest daughter when she, her first year in college called me in a panic one day saying, "Dad, why am I walking down the hall of my dorm and I hear your voice coming out of somebody's room?" I'm like, "Well, I wasn't there. Trust me." <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a legend here at JFK and all in the aviation world, not just here at JFK. I'll tell you. All right, Steve. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you know what? Before we go, we gotta give, give you a little. Uh, party uh, gift. Uh, yes, a parting awesome. gift. All Thank right. You.